Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Paige Graff, and I'll be leading the facilitation of today's event, Observing Earth from Space, an Introduction to Astronaut Photography of Earth. Joining me on today's session is Suzanne Foxworth and Julie Fouché. We work side by side at the Johnson Space Center to bring events like this to those of you from all across the country and sometimes other countries as well. We want to uh, officially welcome all of our participants. We have participants, as you look at this map, from all across the United States, 27 different states, as a matter of fact, we have participants registered from. We also have participants that have registered from Haiti and Mexico. So we welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us today. And all of you out there happen to work with learners in grades pre-K, through 12 and above, including adults. So a wide span of, of individuals that work with learners of different ages. And we're really uh, confident that some of this uh, information that we'll be sharing with you today will be very useful for all of them. I also want to take a moment to welcome our featured speakers, Andrea Mito and Andrew Britton, who are scientists from our Earth Science and Remote Sensing Group, or ESC. RS unit at NASA Johnson Space Center. They are very busy scientists, and we are very lucky to have them with us today sharing some of the work that they do as part of this ESRS unit at the Johnson Space Center. I will say we will be hosting this event again on April 29th if you'd like to rejoin, or we will have future events in the future, uh, and you can always check out our website here. With that, I just want to, again, welcome all of you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I am going to turn things over to our featured speakers. Welcome, Andrea and Andy. Thank you for joining us today. Today, uh, Andy and I are going to talk about observing Earth from space, and this is a basic introduction to astronaut photography of Earth. Uh, like Paige said, we work with within the Earth Science and Remote Sensing Unit at Johnson Space Center. And uh, part of our daily jobs is to work with all of the photos that astronauts take of Earth and um, use them in a variety of ways and uh, spread that information out uh, so that it's all publicly available. So the Earth Science and Remote Sensing team, we are a creative group of Earth scientists, GIS analysts, computational scientists, um, and we all work with astronaut photos of Earth. Um, part of our job is to support NASA in the International Space Station program. Um, our group also operates a payload called Crew Earth Observations, which I will talk about in a little bit. Um, and that is the, uh, the act of astronauts taking photos of Earth for uh, various reasons. Um, and then another part of our job is to curate and host uh, all of the photography that astronauts take of Earth. Um, we have an immense database, and it's all publicly available. And uh, it's part of our job to make sure that um, every photo taken is uh, available for anyone to download. So a brief introduction about myself. My name is Andrea Mito. I'm a geologist by training. Uh, I've done my... If they could turn it on, please. So I have um, my bachelor's and master's in geology from the University of Houston, and then I did my, my master's at uh, Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. And I'll let Andy introduce himself as well. Yeah, I have a bachelor's degree in Earth and Space Exploration from Arizona State University. And then I, I left the great state of Arizona to go to the United Kingdom to pursue a master's in space science. And I obtained that back in 2012. And I've been working with Earth imagery, lunar imagery, and imagery from Mars uh, all since then from various spacecraft. Yeah. And so, um, so we're both geologists by training. We have an immense interest in Earth, Moon, and Mars. And um, we will continue on. Thank you, Andy. So 
So part of what we do um, with our astronaut photography of Earth is we support the ISS program. And so uh, this picture on the left is a photograph taken of the um, International Space Station with Earth below it, or uh, kind of on the right. It's a sideways picture. We also facilitate imagery requests. And so these could be um, researchers from around the world that, that need new or recent imagery of certain places for various reasons. Uh, part of our jobs are to uh, acquire new imagery for them. Another um, important aspect of what our group does is disaster response. And so uh, I'll go into more detail about that in a little bit. But sometimes we will task the astronauts with taking pictures of wildfires or flooding, uh, different types of disaster events that really show up in photography. Something else our group does is we write weekly articles for NASA's Earth Observatory. So if any of y'all are familiar with that, um, usually on Sundays we have a short article written on an astronaut photo. And we publish those um, once a week on Sundays. And so uh, we have a group of writers in our group. There's five of us. And so we rotate who writes uh, which article each week. Our group is becoming quite advanced um, using machine learning algorithms and um, creating our own in-house machine learning models to apply to astronaut photography. Um, we've started off with, um, so this picture is of a, a cloud mask. So there is an astronaut photo below it, but we've used machine learning to pick out which pixels are clouds and which pixels are not clouds. Um, we are, we're also developing our algorithms to um, automatically identify features like Earth's horizon or the moon or certain cities um, and also aurora in astronaut photography, which helps make uh, the next thing I talked about, our photo database, uh, much more uh, easier, easy to search. Uh, so we've got uh, a lot of photos that um, we maintain in our photo database, over 3.5 million astronaut photos of Earth. Uh, which is a lot to sort through. And so we use machine learning to help um, essentially add tags to those photos to make them easier to search for. So a very, very brief history on astronaut photography uh, of Earth. Um, our group curates over 3.5 million photos that astronauts have taken um, of Earth. And this goes back to the Mercury and Gemini missions, the Apollo missions. Um, Skylab, shuttle, and then um, you know anything from the 1960s to today on the International Space Station, we have that entire uh, collection on our website, which I will show you all a link to uh, towards the end of this presentation. And so uh, this is an immense um, this is an immense data set to uh, to sort, organize, and make easily accessible to the public. And uh, some of the challenges are that these are photographs taken by people. And so they're not always nice um, satellite images that are always looking straight down at Earth's surface, but they can be taken at a variety of angles. So I'm going to pose a question to the group. Um, and that is, uh, so does anyone know which, what year humans began working and living uh, in space on the space station? And you can put and your you can answers answer in, in the, the chat. chat window. And we'll see what kind of answers we get. And now for those of you that might be watching the archive, think about this as well. And we've got a variety of answers coming in. Some are saying 2020, 2010, Someone is indicating that maybe we've been living and working on the International Space Station. Keep in mind the International Space Station for maybe 29 years. Someone has actually specified November 2000, actually. There's been a couple of people that have done this. Um, and so we have a wide variety of ranges, but I would say that the large majority seems to be 2000, but we have some people 
uh, earlier than that and some people later than that. So, Andrea, how long have we been living and working in space on the ISS? Yeah, so on the International Space Station, um, this year uh, NASA is, well, NASA and its international partners are celebrating uh, 20 years of continuous manned space flight aboard the space station. And so uh, for 20 years, there has always been an astronaut orbiting on space station in low Earth orbit. Um, and that will continue for years to come, uh, which is quite exciting. And when you think about that sort of longevity, uh, that's a lot of opportunities to take pictures of Earth's surface uh, and pair that with shuttle photography, uh, Skylab, Gemini, Apollo photography, and um, that gives us almost 50, um, over 50, about 50 years of uh, continuous photography of Earth's surface. And so um, that's one of the valuable uh, aspects of this data set is that we can look at uh, how places have changed over time. So let's go to the next slide. So a couple of facts about the International Space Station. Uh, here's a picture of the ISS. Uh, it's orbiting over Earth's surface. And then if you look in the background, you can see the moon as well. And so um, astronauts have lived continuously on board since the year 2000. The International Space Station orbits Earth 16 times every day. That's about every 90 minutes. Um, so I like to say, well, it's true that astronauts, if they're looking out the window, can see 16 sunrises and sunsets every 24-hour period. Uh, the low Earth orbit I've talked about is about 250 miles above Earth's surface. And so there are um, lots of opportunities to take pictures of Earth throughout the day and night. And here are a few photos uh, looking inside um, some of the modules of the International Space Station. On the left, we have there's an astronaut uh, looking out of the cupola window. So this is a, or a cupola module, which is a module with seven windows. It's on the bottom of the space station. And so it's looking, uh, so they can basically look face down at the Earth's surface. Uh, this other picture is of, um, the wharf window, and it's a very optically uh, pristine window for taking very crisp photos. And if you look, these astronauts have huge camera <laughs> cameras in their hands. Like these are very big camera lenses that they attach to um, different Nikon cameras, uh, DSLR cameras that they use. And so um, the picture at the top shows a variety of lenses. It looks like they're Velcroed to the wall of um, one of the modules, and they can pick anywhere from like a, a small 8-millimeter lens, which would take sort of like a fisheye photo, to uh, what these guys are holding, which I think would be an 800-millimeter lens. And so that's, that's a lens that's over a foot long, uh, but at least it's easy to hold in uh, microgravity. Um, but... Given this wide variety of lenses to choose from, that can um, lead to a whole variety of pictures that they can take of Earth. So one of the benefits of astronaut photography uh, from the International Space Station is being able to look at um, Earth from uh, different types of days. So I say variable solar illumination, but really that just means night, day, dusk, dawn. And so the uh, example I'm using here is of Italy. And so we're looking north up the uh, Boot Peninsula of Italy. We've got a daytime photo. We've got a, a dawn or dusk photo and then a nighttime photo where you can see the Italian peninsula uh, lit up as well. And so um, this can be beneficial, especially if you're looking at cities uh, at day or night, really zoomed in photos of cities. Uh, you can see some changes to uh, urban growth or urban uh, development over time. And I'm going to keep using the Italy example because we have so many wonderful pictures of this country. Uh, another benefit it, from the International Space Station is you're able to look at the same target but from a variety of angles. 
And so uh, I've got these four pictures of Italy where we're looking at it at all sorts of different angles. And then um, in the background, you can see Earth's horizon, which I uh, will probably refer to as Earth's limb. That is what we call it. And so uh, an advantage of being able to look at the same target but from different angles is that you can see, um, sometimes you can see uh, different uh, uh, amounts of depth in the landscape, or in this bottom picture, you can see some sun glint off of the ocean and or the Mediterranean Sea. And um, depending on the photo and the lens size they're using, having different look angles can be used to uh, create kind of 3D renderings through photogrammetry of certain areas. So I'm going to use uh, an example or walk you through an example of uh, zooming into a place on Earth uh, using different camera lens sizes. And so still using our same Italy example, you can see the boot here at the bottom of this uh, photograph. Uh, now we're going to zoom into the city of Venice. And these pictures were taken at different times with different lens sizes, but the idea is to show you how the field of view can change depending on um, how big of a camera lens the astronaut decides to use. So I'm going to click through these slides, and the red box will be the area outlined on the next picture that shows up. So we're going to continue to zoom into Venice, and now you're starting to see the lagoon around there and the thin strips of land um, around that area. Zooming in even more, you can see uh, straight uh, through the land, and then uh, you can actually start to see uh, where Venice is. And then this last photo, this was likely taken with like a 400 or an 800 millimeter lens camera, and you can actually see like some of the canals running through the city. You can tell the city's got like a reddish hue to the buildings, um, and so the data set we work with is just incredibly vast depending on the time of day photos were taken, the lens size used, um, and the angle the photos were taken at. Uh, just to talk a little bit more about fields of view, um, shorter camera lenses uh, tend to take broad or wide photos. They tend to capture Earth's limb in the background, uh, whereas um, a larger lens size will be more zoomed in. And so here I'm using California as an example, where with the 16 millimeter lens, uh, you can see pretty much the entire, this is looking south uh, on the coastline of California. You can see pretty much the whole coastline, um, the Sierra Nevadas, and then uh, looking kind of out west towards Nevada beyond that. In this middle photo with the 50 millimeter lens, you can see the Central Valley of California. Uh, Los Angeles would be down at the bottom. And from what uh, our, we work with a group sometimes at Johnson Space Center that uh, uh, take care of the cameras on board and train astronauts on how to use the cameras specifically. And they've told me that um, a 50 millimeter lens, that field of view is equivalent to about um, one human's eye field of view. So if you covered one eye and looked around, that's about as much as what a 50 millimeter lens could see. And then uh, zooming into San Diego on the right, um, just an example of one of the cities that astronauts can take pictures of. So I said our group, um, part of our group runs the Crew Earth Observations Payload. And what this is, is this is an active um, ongoing science and disaster response payload on the International Space Station where astronauts photograph Earth from their unique vantage point on the space station. And so part of what I do, or part of what our group does is we provide daily targets on Earth for astronauts to take photos of. And these targets on Earth are dependent on where the ISS is passing over at a certain time, uh, lighting conditions, because sometimes we need it to be daytime for certain photos, and sometimes we need nighttime conditions. And then we always check the weather uh, at uh, the 
place of interest because if it's too cloudy, well, then you're going to be taking pictures of clouds, and that's not uh, useful for what we're asking for most of the time. So some of the images uh, that we will take or ask for targets are ask for uh, targets of our science requests, looking at certain places of Earth that change over time. Uh, we look at places for urban growth, uh, and also especially night photography is used by certain researchers to track uh, light pollution. And so um, these are science requests that we receive from researchers all over the world. Uh, they funnel these requests through our website, we evaluate them, and then if we approve them, then they become, join our target list, and we actually ask astronauts to take pictures of those targets for researchers. Once the pictures are taken, we process it and then send it to the uh, requester, uh, keeping in mind that all of the data is still publicly available, and um, so anyone could download it as well when they visit our website. An important part of what we do is disaster response. And so uh, we work with the International Disaster Charter and the NASA Disasters Program to have astronauts take photos of certain um, natural disa or disasters as they're happening. And the ones that are most easy to photograph or um, easy to visualize in astronaut photography would be um, fires, smoke plumes, volcanic eruptions, especially if there's a lot of ash. Uh, hurricane damage, as well as the eyes of hurricanes and um, the overall storms in general. Uh, and then uh, it's pretty easy to visualize flood floods as well from astronaut photography. Uh, and on the right here is just another picture of astronaut um, Christina Cook looking out of the ISS cupola window, camera ready to take some Earth obs. Uh, I also like this photo because it kind of gives you an idea of what the rest of the station looks like on the inside. And then towards the top, you can see there's another camera set up with a really big lens. Uh, it looks like it's maybe just ready to go in case the astronaut wants to change or um, target, uh, use a different camera lens. Uh, I see someone in the chat asked about tornado damage. That's pretty hard to visualize with the resolution we get from uh, astronaut photography. Um, we have seen some in instances, but really the usually the damage is so small and localized you can't actually see it from an astronaut photo. So let's see. Next slide. So I'm going to pose another question to the group. And I'm going to ask uh, how might you use this astronaut image? Uh, what about, uh, what would this image help support? Would it be a science response, disaster response, and then um, maybe what type of information could you obtain from photos uh, or images like this? This is a great exercise to be able to think about what type of information can you get from these images? So we're seeing some things that uh, this would likely be a use for perhaps disaster, looking at wildfires, the potential for even some weather conditions, meteorology, so perhaps something related to the wind and the conditions on the surface, um, the locations or rate of change someone has put out for this particular image. Um, it looks like someone else is mentioning disaster response and wildfires, and it can give you information on the size and direction of the fire spread and smoke spread. Now, that's the type of thing, you know, as you're looking at this, that's some great information. Also, we have some other answers about the smoke travel and even the potential of looking at soot deposits, or at least, although you might not be able to see the soot, perhaps you can at least um, get an idea of where uh, those deposits may be falling. Um, uh, let's see. And the, one of the other groups is looking at that this particular image could help with the uh, disaster response and the magnitude for help needed. And someone else is also mentioning, and this is a really interesting point about smoke inhalation 
uh, to civilians or perhaps alerting folks that might have um, some issues with this type of smoke in the air. So what do you think, Andrea? They have some good responses there? Yeah, I would say a lot of their responses were spot on. Um, and so this particular example was from the California wildfire season in 2018. And so um, we're once again looking at California as an example, the Central Valley in the middle. Um, these were very big fires. Um, some of the names I recall, like the Ferguson fire, the Car fire. Uh, just to give you some more context, this lake in the middle is Lake Tahoe. And so uh, we will ask astronauts to take kind of wide view images like this to really give an idea of where smoke plumes have been traveling. Uh, this can be paired with satellite imagery. Um, sometimes, you know, there's definitely advantages to satellite imagery as well as astronaut photography. And sometimes uh, an astronaut just happens to be in the right place at the right time to get these sorts of spectacular photos. So, like I said, this one's kind of a wide um, field of view, whereas uh, other photos the astronaut might take uh, might be more zoomed in. And so here we're looking at the same wildfires, but actually from the opposite direction of where the space station was. So um, let me kind of click back and forth. So this picture, you're looking west towards the coast. But on these photos, you're looking towards the east, towards Nevada and such. And so uh, there's Lake Tahoe again for our reference. And so we'll take photos like this, and we will geo-reference them. And what that means is we'll take the pixel information um, and assign every pixel to a lat long uh, on a base map so it matches an exact location on Earth, and the result looks like kind of this warped image on the right. Um, but actually, it matches uh, the Earth's surface pretty well. And so uh, we will geo-reference photos like these and then deliver them to the U.S. Geological Survey. And then um, that government organization will uh, essentially supply these um, referenced photo layers. that this becomes a, a geo-reference data set. Uh, to those who are actively in need of uh, such data. Um, but yeah, this is uh, this original photo is a little bit warped just because of the angle the astronaut was taking it at, and then geo-referencing it uh, lines it up to scale north, south, east, west. All right, so we're going to do the same exercise again, but looking at a different kind of photo. So um, how might you use this astronaut photo? What would be, uh, what would this image help support, science or disaster? And then what kind of uh, information could you obtain from a photo like this? So I'll open it back up to the chat box. So again, thinking about this specific image and what you can perhaps um, observe in this image. So we're having some people right away jumping in and thought, thinking about this could align with science, dealing with climate change, glacier decline, glacial melt, erosion levels, um, ice coverage and change over time. The melting of glaciers could be perhaps examined, even looking at snowpack and um, uh, potential for flooding. Looking at a rate of change someone else has put in there, um, as well as if you're able to determine anything with lake levels for water. Um, uh, so it really, and, and one of the schools nicely put it out, 1A. So change over time, science, where you can look at, uh, at ideas related to global warming, and so much more. Let's see. I have a... Uh, a pretty detailed response looking at glacial movement, snow and ice pack, um, where you could use the right filters. And perhaps, although I'm not sure we could see this from, um, uh, from an image like this with algae growth, um, that wouldn't be too visible in an astronaut photo, but you could always use other data sets. 
But change over time and ice and glacier information can all be gleaned from this image. Do you agree, Andrea? I sure do agree. Um, yeah, so that, those are some pretty good uh, responses we had there. And uh, you are, those of you who said we are looking at glaciers are correct. These are in the South Patagonia ice fields uh, down in Argentina and Chile. And so these are um, massive glaciers um, uh, that are kind of continuously changing over time. So uh, there are scientists that are very interested in how these glaciers change over time. And so something we will task astronauts with is getting very zoomed in pictures of glaciers like this. And so this photo, we kind of focus on this glacier in the middle. It's kind of looks like, um, I've had students say it looks like a, a frozen slide almost, um, uh, which I think is a pretty fun description of a glacier. And so let me click through. So we're going to, um, there are lots of glaciers kind of hidden in this photo. Uh, I would say if you look at where the lakes kind of, the starts of the lakes where they meet the mountains and then, uh, but there's also some clouds obscuring um, the snow and glacier cover as well. And so we're going to zoom in on this particular glacier here. And so this is the Viedma Glacier in the South Patagonia ice fields. And um, through astronaut photography, we can see how the tongue or the end of the glacier that's touching the water uh, has receded or changed over time. And not all glaciers are shrinking, but uh, this particular one uh, has some pretty obvious changes to it. And so this is uh, an example of what I was talking about earlier about how um, astronaut photography um, is a great record of change over time. And so the first photo is from 2007, the second photo is from 2016, and the third photo is from 2018. And you can see how the tongue of the glacier, uh, it used to uh, curve around um, kind of that bend there has receded um, in recent years. And something else you can look at are the, the moraines or the little black or dark colored stripes going through the glaciers. Um, there are certain um, patterns you can kind of detect changes in those over time as well. I'm going to uh, let's see next. And another exercise. So we're going to look at a different kind of photo. Um, this is a city at night. And so um, same questions once again. I'm really enjoying looking at all of your um, chat responses and seeing how everyone's kind of interpreting these differently. So uh, how would, what would this support disaster science? And then what kind of information could I pull from a, an image like this? So this is a great way to have people think about how you can really utilize these images for different studies. So right off the bat, we're getting a lot of light pollution and looking at urban growth, light pollution studies, urban growth as a whole, um, even electricity usage and being able to perhaps compare one city to another, um, population densities, based on the lights that you're seeing in an urban area. We have light pollution or even urban spread. Um, and so again, I, I love how one of our groups out there says 1C, so science, light pollution, or it even could be something even related perhaps um, they're mentioning to disaster response. I have to think about that one a little bit. Um, so science, urban growth, light pollution, um, perhaps a reflection of economic conditions, um, potential fire damage someone is mentioning. Now, these are mostly city lights, although they look kind of fiery. Um, uh, so population growth um, and the types of street lights, perhaps from the different types of colors of the lights. Uh, so that is really interesting. And even looking at if there's any change over time based on our current situation in the world, 
do we notice more lights or even less lights? So, Andrew, we've got some really interesting answers there, and I'm also even curious as to where this is. Yeah, so we are looking at a picture of London at night. and You can see the, the river running through the middle of the heart of the city. And um, actually, uh, I, I was reading through some of the comments, so we typically have, um, ask for a variety of cities um, at night for different researchers that are interested in light pollution studies. Um, but I had something else jog my memory where um, sometimes after hurricanes or floods hit certain areas, um, we will have disaster responses that are interested in uh, getting night photography of certain areas to see um, where power has been knocked out or how quickly or slowly power is being regained in certain areas. So um, actually night photography can be used for both uh, light pollution science studies and some disaster response. Uh, currently our group has several responses um, or several targets for uh, different cities uh, greatly affected by, affected by COVID-19. And so there are different researchers um, that are interested in studying if there's any changes in um, artificial night light pollution uh, due to perhaps more people staying at home and in certain cities. And so that, um, you know, we, we do try to keep up to date with our active response. And uh, it's really interesting kind of how the, the requests we get change over time. Now that you've learned the, basic of, the basics of astronaut photography, let's explore a few additional images together. So let's start with this background photo that I've had on a lot of my slides. Um, what features do you see in this photo? What kind of stands out to you immediately? And you can answer that in the chat box, maybe the first thing that catches your eye. Oh, so right away we are having the limbs, stars, atmospheric uh, layers, Andromeda galaxy, sky glow, the thin atmosphere, ISS shadow. Um, perhaps you can see, um, let's see, the, the glow of the horizon, part of the ISS, atmospheric lensing, and definitely some of the atmosphere. So we, we've had some now. <laughs> I don't know if I could point out any of the specific um, uh, galaxies out there, but uh, are there a lot of stars out there? <laughs> what do you think, uh, Andrea? Yeah, um, I, I'm not totally sure um, if the Andromeda Galaxy is in this shot or not, but I personally like the name Andromeda Galaxy because it's very similar to my name, Andrea Mito. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's go through what we see in this picture. So the first thing I notice is the bright air glow above Earth's surface. And, um, and then, yeah, someone mentioned the ISS spacecraft, the stars in the background. Uh, and then, I, oh, and then, yeah, lights on Earth. I just saw someone mention that as well. So uh, this could be some sort of exercise you do with your students, um, maybe even more in an for artistic possible reasons, like interpret what you see in this photo or um, where do you think this photo was taken? Uh, it might not be obvious to someone who hasn't heard of the International Space Station or seen a picture like this before. So, um, okay, so I put, uh, where in the world do y'all think this picture is? Um, do you think the different color, what do you think the different colors of blue represent? Um, I'll give you a hint. It's uh, near North America, near Florida. Um, this, this area tends to get hit by hurricanes quite a bit. Um, so yeah, I'm seeing, yeah, the Caribbean, the Bahamas, um, they're saying different bodies of water, but that doesn't really tell us why there might be different shades of blue in these photos. Um, yeah, someone guessed it just right, water depth. So uh, shallower waters are going to have these lighter blue colors where deeper water will have the darker blue shades. And um, 
So yeah, we're looking at Andros Island in the Bahamas and the Grand Bahama Island as well. And um, kind of along the outside of this photo are different uh, components of spacecraft. And yeah, move on to the next one. So another picture for us to look at together, uh, this is looking at Earth's limb. And uh, I kind of just want to see if you can identify any major features in this next photo. Uh, it's definitely got a dichotomy of colors going on between the left and the right. Um, and there's a lot that can be said from uh, looking at this wide of a field of view. And you can literally see different uh, climate zones on Earth. So, um, so I see mountains and lakes, I see snow uh, in the comments, um, someone saying mountains separating ecosystems, I like that. I would, I would argue that uh, mountains separating literally climate zones. Yeah, nice. Um, no specific coastlines uh, in this particular picture, but uh, you know, it does look pretty hazy on the right side. There, there's probably a coastline in the distance, but we can't quite make that out from this photo. So, uh, yeah, right on. Someone guessed the China-India border. So that is correct. We're looking at actually the Himalaya mountain range. And so, um, you know, tallest mountain range on Earth separating India to the south and China to the north. Um, We've got uh, these mountains are so immense that it blocks moisture from going over to China, and so it looks, you know, it's very dry and arid on the other side, with um, lakes sprinkled throughout. Uh, and then even we've pointed out Mount Everest, which is pretty much uh, indistinguishable from all the other mountains in this picture and the clouds as well, which I think uh, is kind of interesting when you look at it from this perspective. Um, these mountains aren't really. Uh, specifically discernible. Andy, do you have anything you want to add uh, to this photo? Uh, no, but I, I just um, liked that someone pointed out that there is um, some kind of ha atmospheric haze on the India side from um, probably human activity, such as burning of crops or just general economic activity. Yeah, um, yeah. So I, I liked the other comment I saw. This is a great lesson for scale and perspective. Um, typically, from the ISS, uh, the distance between where the astronaut is and as far as they can see is about a thousand kilometers, and so that that's a huge um, area um, that one can look at and literally see different climate zones all in one field of view. And it, I, I think pictures like this really show how how connected our landscapes really are um, to each other, to the oceans, and um, just really how our continents uh, kind of work together, are together. Um, you know, you don't see really boundaries at this sort of level. Right, and pollution doesn't really know boundaries typically because uh, we have a delicate, thin atmosphere on our planet. Yeah. All right. And this is the last example I have um, of us just kind of walking through some really interesting, beautiful astronaut photos together. Um, so I, I've given this talk in classrooms a couple of times, and students' eyes always light up when they see this bright green color. And um, yeah, uh, the answers are correct. These uh, happen to be uh, Aurora Borealis. Uh, looking at this picture, um, the land below is a very snowy looking Canada. Um, <laughs> so we're looking at the west coast of Canada, uh, looking to the north um, towards the aurora. Uh, you can also see um, aurora um, in the southern hemisphere as well, um, down south of Australia. And so um, is that looking out over the Pacific side? Yeah, so um, from this point of view, the ISS is over the Pacific Ocean. It would be heading um, heading east. Um, I'm not sure if they're heading northeast or southeast at this mo in this particular shot, but uh, 
uh, that is uh, where we are at in this particular picture. And I think it's interesting how this is a night photo, and yet um, the ground is so lit up. Uh, perhaps there was a full moon at the time, and, um, you know, moon elimination bouncing off of the snow can still make for a bright surface, even though it's uh, nighttime. All right. And so, um, like, photos like these, all of these photos are freely available on our website. Like I said, I'll give you all the link at the end, um, and that'll be made available to everyone on this talk. Um, oh, yes, I had some annotations. Yukon Territory, British Columbia, under the clouds here. So I'm going to hand it over to Andy to talk about some of our freely available resources we have um, re in regards to astronaut photography. Yeah, so as Andrea said, um, all the Earth observa Observatory uh, pictures that you've seen uh, in this slideshow are available on our website. Uh, you can go to our website at eol.jsc.nasa.gov, uh, and you'll get to our Gateway to Astronaut Photography. Uh, the top bar lets you navigate through the website. Uh, our first item that we have there is our search photos page um, where you can access more than 3.5 million images. We're getting close to, I think, 4, 4 million, not too far off in the distant future. And um, there's also another section called collections. If you're interested in looking at a particular feature, such as some of the glacier examples that we saw, or other glaciers, or even volcanoes, or impact craters, we have uh, different collection categories as well. I'll talk a little bit more about our uh, Beyond the Photography section a little bit later. Um, and users can also go over to our Request New Imagery section, and that's where um, people can kind of fill out a form and uh, New imagery can be taken from the ISS to aid their research or for a classroom investigation using inquiry-based learning that is so great today. So if you do search some of our photos, you'll, you'll get to a page like this once you click on one. And uh, all the astronaut photos are freely available to view and download as with so much of NASA data. Here we have an example of uh, some clouds around uh, Puerto Rico. And you can see um, various details, such as where the International Space Station was located when the picture was taken. Uh, data might be also, also be there um, if the data, if the image has been cataloged. There will be uh, the, the center point of the photo. Um, and then you can go on and click to download the photo, uh, whether it's at a full resolution or and set it as like a wallpaper or kind of interact with the photo and, and investigate it for, for science. Um, yeah. They're all yeah. free to download. Yeah, and I just saw someone's comment about the, the NASA podcast. Houston, we have a podcast this week, um, A View from Above, and that uh, was an interview with uh, someone we work with, well, Dr. Uh, well Stefanoff, talking about uh, astronaut photography of Earth as well. So as, as, as Andrea mentioned a little bit early, at the, earlier at the beginning of the slideshow, um, we do write for NASA Earth Observatory with our uh, Goddard Space Flight Center colleagues. And we, there's new articles on NASA images. They're published daily. And once a week, typically on Sundays, there will be a featured astronaut photo. So you can look for those. Those are at earthobservatory.nasa.gov. And those typically have recent imagery as, as far as like within the last few International Space Station expeditions. 
and those can serve as great areas to learn about different spots of our Earth, how, how, our, how the climate is changing, what cities look like from space, um, and that these can be another kind of stepping point for using these articles for research, whether it be in, in uh, Earth science or, or another, another type of topic. These, these can help with that kind of inquiry-based learning as well. Yeah, and um, we we write these uh, we write these articles to be at um, kind of like a, a junior high high school student reading level, and so um, if anything, it could be a short article for students to read that only takes probably a minute or two. Uh, we tend to make them only about a few paragraphs long. Um, so. Uh, so some tools we have on our website are, uh, one of them is called Feature Hunter. And so this is an activity that uh, students can do where they uh, look at photos, astronaut photos of Earth, and can outline certain features uh, like glaciers, um, glaciers, islands, volcanoes, etc. Uh, and then those boxes that people can draw around these features, we then use as training data for our machine learning algorithms so that um, we can further automatically identify the same features in the rest of our 3.5 million astronaut photos. Um, another uh, activity we have on our website is called Image Detective. And so this is where you can look at astronaut photos of Earth and assign a center point latitude and longitude um, to the photo and then type out some features seen in that picture. So this example is of Houston, and so we've got the center point uh, there, Houston, Galveston, and then that shows up as data on our website um, that helps make these photos more searchable uh, to the public. As well as when astronauts get back on the ground, they often like to check out some of the photos that they took while they were on station. So if you've cataloged that photo, that can make it uh, easy for them to find and and share with their fan, their family, their friends, their loved ones, and the, the rest of the general public. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Um, moving on to my next slide. It's, it's loading because it's a video. This is a YouTube video, a compilation of different time lapses uh, different time lapses taken over the Earth. And so sometimes an astronaut will set up a camera at a window and have it take a series of photos every one second, two seconds, more than one photo per second, uh, and uh, essentially take a time lapse. And so the, what we'll do with those hundreds or thousands of photos is we will stitch them together with some video editing software and um, turn them into time-lapse videos that we also post on YouTube and our website. So this particular video is a compilation of different uh, night time lapses. Um, so this particular one is going over North America. You can see some aurora starting to pop up on Earth's limb. And um, these types of... Uh, oh, Hopefully y'all are. Hopefully y'all's video viewing is um, up to speed with mine. Um, this particular video is going over Italy at night. Uh, we can see aurora way farther north in the on the horizon. And so um, this particular shot is uh, of looking at the ISS cupola module. And um, if you can see, there's an astronaut in the cupola, and uh, he opened up all the windows, and he's taking. Um, pictures of Earth, uh, but I guess in another window they also set up their camera to get a time lapse of them taking pictures in the cupola as well. Um, here's another time lapse uh, going over North America. We're passing the Canadian Rockies. Um, to answer your question, in that last one, there, the moon did rise uh, in the middle of that time lapse. And so... Um, 
these aurora pictures are really quite stunning to look at. This frame with, um, it looks like a, a ball in the center of the screen, is a time lapse using a fish eye lens. And it's looking down straight at the earth. It's kind of more of an interesting artistic uh, play uh, using the camera. And then um, this last video, we just went over the Nile River Delta uh, lit up at night. And then uh, we'll continue on with our compilation of different places, typically over North America. If you can see these lakes, the Great Lakes are outlined, and then we're passing the East Coast. Um, I'm really hoping my narrations are going along with the video that you're seeing right now, if it's not too laggy. And the last shot that's shown is actually of a comet uh, being captured in a time-lapse frame. So I will go ahead and pause the video because that's just the credits at the end. And at this point, uh, Andy and I will open it up to any questions that you might have. And all those questions that you might have, we'll ask that you put them in the chat. First of all, I know, and I do realize it is the top of the hour on a Friday afternoon. And for those of you that would like to stay on the line, Andy and Andrea, are you able to stick around for a little bit to be able to answer some questions after this top of the hour? Yes. Uh, yeah. Perfect. I'd be happy to stick around for about 10 more minutes. Awesome. So uh, for those of you that might want to answer or ask some questions, please feel free to put them in the chat and we'll see how many questions we can get answered. I will say that, and I do want to also say thank you to Andrea and Andrew for sharing all of this wonderful content and imagery. And there's so many connections that we can make with our learners, whether it's art or writing or storytelling or science. There's so much that we can do. Uh, so thank you, Andrew and Andrea. So in terms of the video and where you can find that, I will send the link in a follow-up email. And in terms of questions for Andrea and Andrew, um, one of the questions that someone had asked earlier on in the chat was related to the use of handheld cameras and our astronauts versus why not have just a robotic camera taking pictures? Why do we need humans? What's the benefit of using astronaut photography taken by humans? Sure. So um, sometimes, uh, and Sometimes an astronaut, is the, astronaut photo is the only um, freely and publicly available picture uh, taken of a certain area. And so uh, we've had uh, examples of astronauts being kind of the first witnesses to certain volcanic eruptions. Um, I wish I had included some of those photos I didn't think of. But um, another advantage could be, especially the night photography, the, the resolution from the handheld camera is um, much better than any freely publicly available night imagery. And so uh, that is a big advantage we have uh, with astronaut photography. Um, I've seen a question asking if astronaut photos can be used to track plate movement or seismic activity. Um, I'm going to say no, because those are such um, large scale and slow processes, um, that sort of thing couldn't be picked up with a photograph. You would definitely need a network of GPS sensors to track any sort of uh, plate movement or seismic activity. Um, uh, yeah, I guess a little shout out to the Murfreesboro Middle School. Uh, I remember seeing y'all's um, imagery request uh, when I had first started. Uh, and then having gone to school in Carbondale, Illinois, um, I'm very familiar with your town. Um, let's see. Now, also uh, with regards to answering that question, and I'll uh, get to another question here just so we know which question um, we're on, but with regards to the benefits of astronaut photography, Andrew also mentioned how the variability of angles um, can really help complement other data sets, what an astronaut can do with a, with a camera at different times of days and different illumination angles really does help provide some 
great perspectives that can be utilized for um, as part of uh, research and an investigation. So there's there's quite a few benefits. Plus, all humans. How many of you out there could walk around uh, and and be a tourist somewhere and not take pictures? It's an innate thing. It helps the astronauts be able to share what they're doing with um, with everyone. So that's just sort of another uh, aspect of it. Now we had a a question. Oh, that had, uh, oh go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, it's okay. I was going to answer some other questions that popped up. Yes, and one of the questions that had come in from a pre-question that I think our participant has also put into the uh, chat here is, how much training is done with the astronauts on the ground before they actually go to the ISS? Um, yeah, training in general uh, is uh, very wide. Uh, it, you know, it could be anything from... Uh, training we give them on earth science lessons and um, what uh, what we're requesting behind science targets. Um, a whole different uh, training set is just on how to use the cameras. Um, there's just an immense amount of training on learning onboard systems, getting trained to fly in um, rockets up to the space station, all sorts of endurance tests. Um, it's it, it's really like a, a whole list that I don't know the answer to, um, but they go through an immense amount of training uh, in general. <laughs> well, I'll add that our folks there with the Earth Science and Remote Sensing Group, they actually provide training to the astronauts for uh, the imagery that they will be taking from station, helping to orient them, to increase their own background knowledge on the science as well. So our group, these folks like Andrea and Andrew, um, they do work with the crew. And like they mentioned earlier, they send the crew a message every day to say, These is a, this is a set of images we want you to be able to take um, on a given day. Um, now, here's another question um, that has come in about what other departments or specialists mostly what, uh, what departments or specialists use this astronaut photography? Like for the disaster relief, is there a specific group that asks for this data? Can you talk a little bit about that? So um, all, all, what our group does is we will geo-reference um, disaster imagery and send it to the GS, um, oh, sorry, the U.S. Geological Survey. And so from there, that uh, government entity will uh, disseminate the uh, imagery to who needs it specifically. So uh, all I know specifically is that we send it to the U.S. Geological Survey, and then they take it from there. Um, this sort of data does not require a security clearance because uh, it's uh, all publicly available public domain photography um, of Earth. And so everything that's really done is all open and available for the public. Um, and so, which is the great part of, um, for all you folks out there to be able to use this imagery in such a wide variety of purposes. Now, one of the groups is asking if it's possible, you know, in an astronaut image, sometimes it's hard to tell what can you glean from an image. But one of the groups is asking, is it possible to monitor vehicle headlights at night? Uh, is that something you can see uh, in an astronaut image? Um, I would say not individual headlight uh, headlights on cars, but um, you know, some of some of the night nice photos you can clearly see uh, major roads and highways, and whether or not that's lighting along the highways or um, you know an entire group of cars, uh, you, you can't tell unless you're there. So. Um, you know, you can't get down to that fine of detail. You, you're not really able to see vehicles or cars at the highest resolution that astronaut photos can be taken at. And, but it is interesting to think about that one picture of London and the coloration of lights. There's yellows and whites, and so those could be interesting things to look at. But, yeah, at that, uh, uh, at that resolution, individual headlights, um, uh, an interesting thought, but maybe a little too difficult to be able to do. Now, we did have a... Yes. Go ahead. 
Oh, yeah. Some of the night photography of cities are kind of interesting because, yeah, sometimes you see lights with, like, white hues um, and yellow hues, and this could be due to uh, incandescent bulbs versus LED. Uh, but something else to keep in mind is it also depends on, like, the camera settings uh, that the astronaut used. So, like, the shutter speed and the aperture can affect, uh, like, how yellow or white certain uh, pixels turn out in night photography. So, uh, I do take those with a grain of salt just because it can be camera dependent as well. I will point out that it is possible to download the raw version of these images. It, it takes a little while and it's a larger file. But if you, if you have the photo editing software to view a raw image, say from a Nikon camera, you can do so and import it into your photo editing software and have the highest quality um, kind of product available to you over using the standard JPEG file. Yeah. Great point there, Andy, especially for those of you that like to work with those intricate details of those photos. That can be a real asset for you. Now, speaking of sort of um, software, one of our groups is wondering what type of software do you use for sorting through your 3.5 million photos and the archiving? Is there a particular software that gets used? Um, I, I wouldn't say not a software, but a variety of um, scripts and coding that goes into it. Um, yeah, every photo has a metadata file associated with it from the camera like the exact time a picture was taken, and then we can run our script to pair that with exactly where the ISS was at the time the picture was taken. And um, so really, it, it's not a software that sorts the photos. It's um, a, a whole bunch of code and scripts um, that we can use to kind of discern when and where a photo was taken. Uh, I had also mentioned earlier how we are developing our machine learning algorithms to automatically identify certain features in photos, uh, and this will this work will continue. Um, our ultimate goal is to have uh, the center points of photos automatically uh, uh, cataloged uh, as uh, we run them through our machine learning models, uh, and that would make our photos um, much more searchable. Um, so, like, for example, you might have a picture of Florida, but the ISS was over Texas at the time it was taken, and so um, that's kind of a challenge where sometimes the photo is farther away than you would think, uh, and so that can make it difficult to search for photos sometimes. And what's interesting is someone had asked earlier, what can we do to help support um, the efforts of this group? And I would say that things like Feature Hunter that Andrea and Andrew mentioned, as well as Image Detective, um, by having people um, from the general public be able to help catalog and provide data about these images, it really does help make them more searchable for people in general. And all of that has to be done by hand. And you might think, well, why does it have to be done by hand? And Andrea showed you so many examples of that, you know, even if you're looking at Florida, but you're over Texas, and depending on which way the astronaut was facing when that image was taken, it sometimes can be challenging to figure out where in the world an image actually is. So that becomes um, where people like you uh, can help out. And so we encourage you to check out um, a Feature Hunter as well as Image Detective. And the other thing I'll mention is that we do have an amazing group of programmers that work with Andrew and Andrea that enable us and our team to be able to uh, do some of this work without necessarily using uh, um, some other type of software program. Uh, so as Andrea alluded, there's a whole lot of scripts that are actually built and things that uh, enable our folks to be able to do their work in-house. So here's a question about priorities, and they're wondering what's the hierarchy of priority considerations when requesting an image um, to be taken? Sure. So um, I'll answer this, and this can be our last question of the afternoon. So uh, I had talked about 
the targets we take pictures of and what would be our priority. Um, so we group the pictures, uh, unless it's, I would say our highest priority picture are our disaster response imagery. Um, and then um, from there, it pretty much is an even playing field between science, uh, support, and other types of requests. And so um, really, uh, you know, given the work day of an astronaut, uh, usually we only have about, you know, one to five targets we might ask for per day. Um, and if there were more, usually the weather conditions are such that uh, it eliminates some options on a given day. And we certainly don't want to have an astronaut go to the window to take a picture if all they're going to see is clouds. So they yeah. are very busy. And so being able to make sure that they can use their time wisely for the other tasks that they're doing on station as well as for the imagery that is requested as well is very important. Cool. Well, um, thank you, everyone, for your questions and listening today. Um, uh, I was really happy to give this webinar. I'm always happy to talk about astronaut photography and uh, continue the outreach that we do uh, through this media. So thank you all very much.